Welcome to everyone. It is good to see you here after a holiday weekend. We are pleased that you've joined us. Uh, I will quickly introduce myself and do a visual description. My name is Bevan Croft. I use she, her pronouns. I am a white woman with blonde hair worn up in a bun. Um, and I am sitting in a room with plants uh, over my left shoulder and a bookshelf over my right. I co-direct the National Center on Advancing Person-Centered Practices and Systems, which we call NCAPS. And I'm very pleased to be welcoming you all to our webinar, Redefining Person-Centered Planning in Mental Health Systems. So if you can go to the next slide, please, Elaine. Please do say hello in chat, um, and you're welcome to use chat um, throughout the webinar to engage with one another and with us. Um, NCAPS is a National Technical Assistance Center. We are supported by the Administration for Community Living and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Uh, my counterpart, Alex Bernardi, uh, uh, co-directs NCAPS with me and uh, the rest of the NCAPS team is, is here um, uh, and will be engaging with you on chat and helping to run this webinar today. Next slide, please. We, as a technical assistance center, um, our mandate is to promote systems change that makes person-centered principles not just an aspiration, but a reality in the lives of people um, uh, uh, throughout, throughout their lives. Um, and so the, today's topic is particularly uh, particularly salient um, for, for reasons that, that will become clear as we, as we continue to the discussion. Um, let's go to the next slide. I'll, I'll cover just a few more housekeeping pieces. Uh, this is a webinar format, so you are muted, um, although you should be sure to use chat. If you'd like to engage with everyone, please, please be sure to select everyone uh, just above the chat window. Um, uh, you can include questions for the panelists, questions for other participants, uh, et cetera. Um, we will have uh, a little time uh, for Q&A um, towards the end of our uh, afternoon today. You may access um, uh, English and Spanish, uh, uh, English interpretation, uh, excuse me, ASL interpretation and uh, and Spanish uh, uh, interpretation in um, a couple of different ways. If you would like English captioning, uh, you can click the CC button at the bottom of your screen. And live uh, Spanish interpretation can be accessed by clicking the interpretation button, um, which is the world icon at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll have just a couple of polls today at the beginning and the end. Um, and I believe the next poll is coming up now. Um, oh, first, uh, also in chat, Sashka will place a few different times a uh, link to the slides, which you're welcome to download. We have a few slides today to accompany um, two of our presenters' presentations. Um, and you're also welcome at any time to give us feedback at our email address, ncaps at hsri.org. Just remember that during the webinar, we will be looking at chat, but not at the email address. Um, and I think this poll is coming up next. Please take a moment um, uh, when the poll pops up on your screen to select all that apply in terms of roles that you uh, self-identify with and recognizing that we all identify in many different roles. Um, if there's a role that you do not see um, represented here on chat, um, uh, here in the poll, please, um, put that into chat. You are welcome to um, describe any other role that's relevant to this discussion in chat. And I will describe quickly the options. Um, they are a person with a disability or a person who uses long-term services and supports, 
a family member or loved one of someone who uses long-term services and supports, a self-advocate or advocate, peer specialist or peer mentor, a social worker, counselor, or care manager, a researcher or analyst, a community or faith-based service provider, organization employee, uh, or a government employee. So we'll give folks just another moment to respond. Um, and I see in chat, um, there are, uh, we have a registered nurse here, um, some researchers, um, folks who identify as disabled, lawyers, welcome. Um, good to see everyone. All right, so um, in terms of the polling questions, um, we see a broad representation across the different categories that we have offered up, um, including uh, about almost half of you are government employees, welcome. Um, a good number of social workers, counselors, care managers. Um, we have people with, people with disabilities, family members and loved ones, uh, self-advocates, uh, peers. Um, welcome to, to all of you. All right, we will get started next. Um, so, um, you know, as I mentioned, NCAFS's role is to uh, make person-centered principles, not just an aspiration, but a reality um, in the lives of people who use services. Um, so what does that mean? Uh, in, in many ways at NCAPS, we work very hard to operationalize terms and ideas that um, can be very non-Pacific. So um, person-centered uh, means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And, um, and it's used as a buzzword um, in, in many places. Um, at NCAPS, we really ask uh, as critically as possible, what does person-centered really mean um, in terms of um, people's experiences within long-term service and support systems? And um, we recognize that that's a very complicated question. Um, and as a first step, um, we need to, to, to talk about of what it what it should mean, um, as well as what it does mean based on people's experiences. So we've assembled today a panel of folks who have a lot to say about what person-centered uh, planning could mean, should mean, um, and 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 how it plays out. Um, and so that's the conversation we're hoping to open up today, um, and really looking forward to to hearing to hearing from 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 all of our um, panelists and from you. Um, so I will uh, introduce each of our five panelists um, uh, before their remarks. Um, and our first panelist is Lionel Frechette. Lionel is a deaf, multiply disabled queer person with 16 years of uh, living with extreme states and six years of both working with the mental health system in different capacities and receiving services. Uh, they bring their personal experience and person-centered ethics to the table. Their ultimate dream is to create equity through diverse spaces and to strengthen allyship across communities. Lionel, welcome. All right, hello everyone. My name is Lionel Rochette and I use they, them for my pronouns. And here I want to talk, I want to explain to you about the person-centered planning. So I want to explain, I'm going to explain to you what's on the slides and then I'm going to elaborate a little bit on that as well. And I am with the Wildflower Alliance. Next slide, please. So person-centered planning should center agency. Does this person have agency in their care? Are they present in the room and informed about what choices are available for them? What does person-centered mean to them? So person-centered is, well, what that means 
Hold on. Is the person has is able to make the decisions for themselves um, and not have other people make decisions for them and then inform them of what that is. So some people, they need to decide like what they want or to inform um, or advise on what they need. And this last part. Some people, some people need, uh, can make decisions on their own. And some people require some input or advice or information in order to make their own decisions. versus non-centered is someone else making decisions for you. Next slide, please. Have you, oh, go ahead. Have you ever seen or had to write these words? Patient declined services, patient was not compliant with medication administration, patient refused to meet in person. Why is the onus of inadequate services or accommodations often put on the person as the difficult client in their records? So that example is um, person centered planning. It's not because it makes the decisions for. Uh, to, to, it makes the decision to reject services. So the person should be able to, on their own, be able to make their own decisions. Because everybody has their own reasons whether they would accept a service or reject a service. So oftentimes they'll put down on the records, like the patient declined the services or they refused uh, to be seen in person, or, and it's documented that this uh, is a difficult client or a difficult patient. Uh, and that information goes to insurance. And so this can create complications when in fact, everybody has their own reason for de determining whether they want a service or not. It has to be a balance between the patient and the staff and the patient has to be empowered with their own decisions. And, it, and because these decisions are documented on, uh, are documented. Next slide, please. Instead of viewing services provided as an open offer that can be rejected neutrally, services are viewed as what is best for them, bypassing the per person's agency entirely. So this means that um, there's no boundaries between the staff and the patient. There should be equality. And this doesn't happen and the staff starts to take on like a parental role. We can't decide for the patient. The patient needs to decide for themselves and have the ability and the agency to make their own decisions. Next slide, please. What does the right to refuse mean? Child care, disability, language barriers, cultural differences, work schedules, none of your business, all can be reasons for not finding an offer helpful. So let me expand this a little bit. So when we take care of Like someone might have children they need to take care of. And so therefore they are not able to show up for an appointment or um, they might not wanna discuss a very vulnerable issue in front of their children so they don't, can't bring their children to the appointment. So that might be uh, maybe the, the location of the appointment is inaccessible scent wise or not accessible to a wheelchair. Um, this might be why certain people 
many different reasons why someone might refuse a service. There's all sorts of different barriers. It could be uh, linguistic um, language preferences or choices or language ability, or there's no availability of an interpreter or sometimes there's obviously they can't find an interpreter, cultural differences. There's so many different um, reasons. Uh, for another reason might be someone has difficulty scheduling their work. Maybe they work from nine to five, but the hospital or the outreach center schedule is in conflict to their work schedule. Um, they could decide because of that, not to accept an offer because of that. There's so many reasons. Next slide, please. One reason for declining an offer of services by proxy of being deaf, my communication is dependent on the ability to be understood by my interpreters. Receiving services can be frustrating and the hidden labor of constantly requesting interpreting can take a toll on me. So this is just an example of during this presentation of how, um, the, for instance, the interpreters are reading the slides because I want to make sure it's really clear that it's presented through English and that it's being spoken directly in English, but it's tough in, in sort of intermediary, intermediary services if I can't access them if there's no interpreter or I don't understand the interpreter or if the interpreter turns down a job or cancels or, um, or is unable to find an interpreter. Next slide, please. A trap for workers can fall into how can I help this person when they don't want to be helped? There is no way to help someone in ways they do not want to be helped. The best that can be done is to connect them to their lives and the decisions that they make. A reaction to feeling powerlessness can be appearing to self-destruct as a form of recovering agency. So when I've experienced sort of loss of power is when uh, a decision could have been made or um, maybe an er a wrong decision was made that impacted me and impacted my uh, self-confidence, my self-agency. So next slide, please. A businessman losing money on stocks does not get a conservatorship. The intersection of class, race, gender, mental health diagnosis, and disability inform the level of authority given to others over a person. So here, um, my example is just a businessman who is viewed as capable to make decisions on his own even if he's made wrong decisions and is losing money. But if someone is disabled or mental health diagnosis or their class or their race or their gender, they're viewed as not being able to make decisions or always making bad decisions. And so oftentimes what is best for them is determined on this opinion of the, who they are or their ability to make their own decisions. Next slide, please. Often, this often, uh, this identification is, um, for example, in education, this one says, um, everybody will grade it on their ability to climb this tree. And you can see in this picture in the tree, there are all sorts of different animals at the tree. And so a bird, versus a uh, leopard, versus the uh, alligator, snake, all these different animals, they don't have the same ability for climbing the tree in the same way. 
So what this means is that climbing the tree is sort of assimilating, right? The tree is the symbol of assimilating. Next slide, please. Everyone will be evaluated on their ability to assimilate. So what this means is when we use standards uh, of what is normal, we, uh, we, um, we ignore the different abilities of each and every different person. And also the ability of that person to be able to make their own decisions. And we measure people by this standard of normality and it doesn't work. Next slide. Next. For true person-centered planning that powers someone, puts them in the room and let them guide the conversation. Sometimes the best way we can be is present. Right. So we have to guide the conversation. That means that we can communicate fully, understand what's going on, know what the choices are that's available and don't measure them by what we consider as normal or what we um, think is the, uh, how, we don't connect them based on our vision of what life is or should be, but really look at it from their perspective. So next slide, please. Thank you all for your time. I appreciated it. And um, let me know if you have any other questions in our question and answer at the end of this presentation. This is Bevan again. Thank you so much, Lionel, for kicking the conversation off. Uh, next, we will invite Sarah Davidow into the space. Sarah is a filmmaker, activist, and mother of two. As a survivor of physical, sexual, and emotional abuse, she has faced many challenges throughout her own healing process. At present, she spends much of her time working at the Wildflower Alliance, a peer-to-peer -peer training organization that was recognized in 2021 by the World Health Organization as providing exemplary rights-based crisis alternatives. Welcome, Sarah. Thanks, Bevan. So my name is Sarah. I use she, her pronouns. I have long reddish-brown hair. I'm wearing glasses. I am white. I am in front of a blue wall that has framed uh, magazines from our history, uh, or, or at least for those of us who are part of the psychiatric survivors movement, like Madness Network News, et cetera. And I am so interested to talk to you about this topic because I think it was 20 years ago that I started to work with people who were really focused on person-centered planning or patient-centered planning, whatever the term was. And I was really curious when this came up again now, would it be different? Because back then, some of the things I remember thinking was like, this doesn't feel very person-centered because there'd be this checklist, this checklist of what makes it person-centered. And it would be things like, is information translated into Spanish? And that is important. That's so important that information be translated into Spanish. But what about having other information? You know, is it just so, hey, we've taken all the information of things we already believe and we've translated it into the language that you speak. That's a step in the right direction, but it is not the same as actually expanding what we're actually talking about beyond just the things that the people who've are always had the control of, of the pamphlets and the brochures, et cetera, have. And then I also think uh, Lionel brought in the language of compliance very early on in this conversation. And I think about that and I think, yeah, those same people who are going through that checklist of not very person-centered, person-centered things, 
they were also still the same people who were talking about whether or not someone was compliant or non-compliant with their treatment plan or their psych drug orders or what have you. And I really want to say here right now that that language of compliance and non-compliance, there is no way to use that language in a person-centered system. There is no way because it is violent language. And when I say that, what I mean is that the people who hurt me most as a child, and as was already said, I'm a survivor of sexual, physical, and emotional abuse. People who hurt me the most were people who told me that I was bad if I did not do what I was told. And then as a result of that harm that was caused to me as a child, I found myself on a path that led into the mental health system, where again, I was told, you are bad if you do not do what you're told. I'm like, that's the same message. So one of the messages before I start pulling slides up, and I just have four of them that I want to offer you, is a quote from Pat Deegan, which is, help isn't help if it doesn't help. And it's certainly not person-centered. Okay. So it, as a part of preparing for this, I'm thinking like, all right, that was 20 years ago. Surely it's gotten better now. Surely systems are, are using something that looks different than 20 years ago. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of skeptical, so I'm not sure I really believe that, but I'm saying that for the purpose of this presentation, surely it's changed. So I looked, I Googled, and I found articles from 2020, 21, 22, that had things like eight dimensions of patient-centered care and uh, seven attributes and six elements. And now I have a slide up that has popped up those different titles in different colors, orange, blue, and yellow. And what I found was a sea of words that they were using in each of those very recent articles where they're describing like the state of the art beliefs around what person-centered or patient-centered care is. And it included words like coordination, continuity, empathy, information, attendant, being attentive, preferences, all words I have at the bottom of this slide. And yet when I really dug into what they were saying, it, it just, it didn't actually look that different. It still looked like what it looked like in the past. And so now I have this slide up that says nothing about me without me, which is, you know, a, a take on this uh, saying that I think has been used in the cross-disability movement and psychiatric survivors movement for so many years. Nothing about us without us, right? But the things that we're told, even by people who are saying person-centered care is a priority, are the things that are appearing in little quote bubbles here. Like, okay, you can come to the meeting where we're going to talk about you now. I remember being when I worked in the conventional clinical system at a meeting where people were talking about things like person-centered care, it was the same people. And they invited, I went to a treatment team meeting that had a huge number of people, something like over 20 people were there. And they invited the woman that the meeting was about to it. And it was seen as this great progress. But what happened? She sat there completely intimidated by the number of people around the table. She was at the table, but she wasn't really able to speak because look at that orange bubble down at the bottom. Speak up if you can, but we've got a lot to say. You know, that's basically what happened. Everyone, all the quote unquote professionals in the room wanted to keep talking, wanted to uh, have their voice heard and no one had supported her to be prepared. No one was kind of on her side, making sure her voice got heard over people who had degrees listed on pieces of paper and had come there seeing themselves as the experts. Ultimately it became, you know, we'll, we'll give you a seat, but it's at, still at our table. And that's what that purple bubble says up uh, toward the top right. Now, when I looked at these articles a little bit more closely, I just, you know, I saw things that I thought were really Interesting, not heartening, but interesting. So on this slide, I have some of the things I pulled out of those. And so number one is out of the eight dimensions article. And I thought it was so interesting that number one in the eight dimensions article was something about respect for the patient's values, preferences, and expressed needs. But when I cut and pasted the entire article into a Word document and asked me to tell, uh, to, asked it to tell me how often the word culture appeared in 3,619 words, the word culture appeared once. And it was only in the context of 
whether or not people have a culture of using email or not, period. That was the only place where culture showed up. So there's a real disconnect there. How can you really value people's preferences, express needs, et cetera, if you're not paying attention to and asking them about and exploring their culture, their experiences, their perspective? So the seven attributes actually came from the same document as the eight dimensions. And it talked about superb access. I think that's a really funny phrase, but the phrase aside, it ultimately was talking about access to the same old care options that was all, always have been available. And those options do not consider culture. Again, to go back to my 20 years ago example, you can translate something into another language, but that is not the same as considering the culture and heritage and cultural practices of the people who speak that language. And that is not something that I am seeing even in places that profess to be using person-centered care. So then we come to the six elements. The six elements was a different article. And in that article, it talked about in number two, evidence-backed treatment. And this was an interesting one because basically in evidence-backed treatment as a, a six elements or as the second element of person-centered care, what it was basically saying is, you know, we have all these people who show up and they've been influenced by famous people and other things on the internet and they think they know what they want and we have a responsibility to tell them what they actually need to know about what's available. And, you know, there's a little piece of truth in that. Sometimes some of us can be misled. There's a lot of information out there uh, that is not accurate and you know, it's, it's useful to have doctors and others collaborate with us and say, here's the information I have, and here's the information they have, and let's figure out where to go. But the whole energy of this number two was this whole idea that we couldn't possibly know, like, we're just, you know, we, we could, we're just looking on the internet, and we're being silly, and we come in with these silly ideas, and what do we know? That was the energy of it, and I found that pretty disturbing, especially when if we looked at this system of evidence-based practice, it's a like historically full of bias. It's full, so much full of bias, and I forget some of the exact statistics. We talk about this in one of our other trainings, our anti-oppression training that I actually do with Ebony and another coworker of mine. But evidence-based practice, particularly in the psychiatric system, I think it's something somewhere around 5% of the people that are researched, the people, so people who are receiving services who are researched when determining if something is an evidence-based practice are people who aren't white. So that's like over 90% of the people who are researched are typically white people. And then over 80% of the people doing the research are also white. So that's just one facet of equity and, and diversity that I'm talking about. But if we know that, then we know evidence-based practice in and of itself is hugely biased, is hugely influenced by the culture that, you know, the sort of white America, um, I hesitate to call it culture, but you know, this this world, this society that we live in, and who conventionally has had the power to determine what is best practice. So when you pair that knowledge with what the six elements says, it becomes really disturbing to me anyway. So that's what's on this slide, along with a picture on the right there of an abstract person. It's a blue background with a yellow abstract person with some different colors kind of dripping down their face, green and red, uh, and some drops in the background. So this page, and this is my last slide, is just kind of like what I find that person-centered care looks like and what it should be. And the reality is I want to be clear that that right column, the what it should be, should actually be way more expanded upon. It'd be like a whole nother long conversation with lots of slides and lots of words if we really wanted to talk about what it should be, but I just wanted to give kind of a summary here. So on the left, I have what it looks like provider provides information. And that's kind of what we heard in some of those examples I was saying earlier, but reality parties exchange information. And we're really seeing, you know, if I'm coming, even if I'm the one coming for care, coming for support, that I'm seen as having valuable 
information just as valuable as other people in the room. There's something really important about that concept of the greatest, you know, we, we are the wisest about ourselves. The wisdom lies within. We might need support from others to uncover or peel away the layers that have gotten put on by traumas and everything else, but we know ourselves the best. Moving from information available in other languages to information is in other languages and informed by other cultures. That's so important. So on the left, people are talking about like the doctor slows down enough to make space for patients' questions and concerns. But in actuality, on the right, what it says is provider practices humility and considers many perspectives, including those that make them uncomfortable. Providers have a ton of power to feed their biases. If something seems too weird or seems too, you know, doesn't make sense to them, they, they have the right to, or the power anyway, to, to dismiss. And I'm just going to give you a quick example. There's a film that we have that we made in 2012 called Beyond the Medical Model. And in that film, there is featured somebody who has this experience of hearing voices and uh, other um, unusual, what would be termed unusual beliefs to, to many others. And he talks about that a little bit. And he happens to also be an artist whose experiences that his art is transmitted to him through his fingers onto the canvas through aliens. Now for a lot of providers that has been what earned him a space in the hospital, <laughs> that sort of thing. But the reality is he's living a good life. How do we get to the point where our systems are asking how does someone's beliefs, the way they're living, their culture, how does it actually support them to, to live a good life? And, and if I think it's weird, unusual, too foreign to me, what have you, like, what does that matter? If that person is living the life they want to live, if that person is living a good life, that, so, you know, why should the system, why should a mental health provider care that this person believes this is how their art is getting transmitted if in fact they're living a full good life and a life that they want to be leading. So the next one down is centers evidence-based practices. And what I'm suggesting we're shifting to is centers relevant cultural practices alongside evidence-based practice. We don't have to dismiss all research. We have to just be aware of its bias. We have to, to know that there are problems and uh, weaknesses to all of that. And then we get to things like notes. Can read notes or request access versus what we move to can read notes without having to request access and suggest corrections. And ideally in many places not have notes at all or write the notes themselves. Uh, in the world I am in, we do not have notes because it's caused too many of us harm by following us around and, uh, and representing a time in our life or someone else's vision of our life uh, that is just not accurate. And then versus giving, and this is the last piece I'm going to offer you, moving from gives a seat at the table to build a whole new table with tools to manage this table until that can happen. In other words, like let's reduce the harm of the table we have for now with tools that we can come up with, but ultimately the goal has to be to build a new table. So I will just end by saying again, help is not help if it does not help. And then I will stop. This is Bevan, thank you. Sarah, for, for those remarks and, and, and for laying uh, all of that content out for us so helpfully. Um, now I would like to introduce to you Andy Boreski. Andy works for Wildflower Alliance, supporting and advocating for folks who have struggles around their substance use. In the past, he's worked at AFIA, the peer-run respite in Massachusetts, and as director of peer support for a clinical provider agency. Uh, working within the mental health system has only strengthened Andy's belief that people receiving, receiving services have the fundamental right to have their voices and choices reflected in every stage of their treatment planning and services delivery, as well as um, information and access to alternative healing modalities. Welcome, Andy. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, my name is Andy Pareski. My pronouns are he, him. I'm a... Um, a white guy with a beard and short hair wearing glasses. Um, uh, I'm, I'm in a greenish colored room with kind of landscape um, pictures on the walls and a colorful tapestry behind me. Um, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here today. This is a, a topic that's near and dear to me in that um, it, it was it was tough working in a, in a clinical provider agency at times when what we were doing in peer support was really what person-centered planning is, is supposed to be, and yet we were looked at as if we were like the radical ones who are growing two or three heads out of our shoulders when really what we were doing is just trying to kind of advocate and exemplify some of the, that some of the principles of what person-centered planning was. And I think it was really interesting that when we were doing this, it was the reason we'd so often be demonized was because people didn't really have a fundamental understanding of what person-centered planning really is. Um, their, their definitions were kind of lacking. I think at best providers didn't have an adequate understanding um, and that could lead to some real harms and real muddying of the waters of what the best practices were, or what it should look like. And at the worst, sometimes when things came into conflict with person-centered principles, it would go into this world of, well, person-centered planning, there's different definitions. And that's where things started to get a bit more odious because they're, they're, they're saying that kind of to, to justify things that are directly not in line with any person-centered principles that I'm aware of. Um, and yeah, so to start off, I just wanted to read a couple of quick definitions that I found about what person-centered planning is and kind of show where these discrepancies might come from. It's good to see that a lot of you here today are, are from the, working for the government because most of the better definitions I found were from state government um, websites, actually. So Here's one from the Nebraska Government Resource Library. It says, person-centered planning is a process-oriented approach empowering people to live, to plan their life, find their voice, and work toward reaching their goals. The goal of person-centered planning is to support participants to be the center of planning their supports and goals. Okay, that, that's all well and good, and it sounds very lofty and idealistic. I mean, I don't have a problem with that. Um, Let's go to the next one. This is from the New York State government. Person-centered planning is a discovery process used to search out what is truly important to and about a person and what capabilities and skills that person possesses. It is values-based with the knowledge that each and, every, each and every individual has unique capabilities and skills. And, and you'll notice those two definitions, what they have some overlap. I like that both of them um, mentioned that it's process oriented, but the, but each of them gets into kind of some different nuances of what person-centered planning is. Um, since I'm I'm in Massachusetts, I was curious what the Massachusetts um, government website had to say. And they actually had a, a whole FAQ page um, that was pretty interesting with that theirs started more like what some of the things Sarah went over with more elements in getting into them. So it was it was three bullet points. Person-centered planning is Bullet point number one, a collaborative process, again, that word process, of conversations directed by consumers in partnership with care providers and natural supporters. Bullet point two, that fosters recovery orientation and care planning discussion. Bullet point three, and results in a treatment service individual action plan endorsed by the consumer, which addresses his or her needs with and preferences and promotes recovery. Now, What's interesting here is um, I'm sure some of you can appreciate that person-centered planning has kind of become a buzzword. Um, you know, we all kind of know if we want funding, if we want to be re kind of respectable in our in our profession, we have to use it in the language and and hopefully incorporate it on a deeper level, but that's not always the case. And so I find like what we're getting into here is a lot of other buzzwords, one of which that comes up in that Massachusetts definition is, of course, um, recovery orientation. And that's that's a whole other thing that I don't want to get into today. But I just find it interesting that we kind of jump from buzzword to buzzword and neither of them has been really, really defined. Um, 
So some of the definitions that I did find that were very robust, and I'm just going to, I'm not going to sit here and bore you with reading off definition after definition. So I'll pop this into the, into the chat. The Pennsylvania um, government, our uh, disability and aging page has a really robust definition of um, person-centered planning that is really not written for providers, but is written for people who receive services. And I think that's pretty good. Um, it, it's, I'm not gonna, like I said, I'm not gonna get into the whole thing because it's very, very robust. What I am gonna get into is, I don't really think that just defining what person-centered planning is does, does the process credit. I, I don't think you can really, what, while there's obviously being able to describe it in a meaningful way is important, it, it can't end there. And I think that's the problem. Being able to use person-centered planning in a sentence isn't really what the work is about. Um, it's very nuanced. It's more of a philosophy of care than a definition and any philosophy is gonna be nuanced. And I think you really have to supplement any definition of person-centered planning or practices with other things. Um, you're gonna need proper trainings. You need actual skills that are in alignment with person-centered planning. You need best practices and that doesn't mean evidence plate based practices often it means what people in your programs and services like the best it means actual tools that people who are, are are charged with implementing these philosophies of care can understand and use and it needs some kind of critical feedback usually some kind of fidelity or integrity tool that people can use to self assess but also direct feedback from the people who are in again are in these programs or receiving services. I, I, from my experience, the, the programs and the services that tend to work the best are the ones that people like the most. If people like something, if they, if they really feel good about their services, they're more likely to, to, to basically engage in it in a meaningful way. They're more likely to want to do it. Um, if, if there's anything in there that's a barrier, including defining to them what person-centered practices look like, that right away is gonna be a turnoff. And that's when you start to get, again, into some of the things Sarah and Lionel were talking about, about people being non-compliant and whatnot. And I agree that that has no, that kind of language has no business in any kind of um, person-centered um, planning. Uh, going back to that FAQ, if we're really going to get into the, the what I'd say is the key nuance here, there was there was a great Q and A section in that Massachusetts um, FAQ I found that says number question number two. Don't we already do person centered planning? It has been built into all our work, and the answer was many providers believe that the work they are currently doing is person centered. While the person being served may be the focus of activity, it does not necessarily mean that they are the one who is directing the activity. And, and if you take anything away from what I'm saying today, I think that's the key nuance right there is, is the person directing it? And it goes back again to that seat at the table. Yeah, you, you can give someone a seat at the table and that's, that's, that's fine. And fine meaning, you know, it's, it's a start. But if you're not giving them their own table where they can literally, the, where the process is directed by their voices, their choices, it, it's not gonna go anywhere. They're, they're just, it's gonna, it's gonna be like Sarah said, it's gonna be them being intimidated by a bunch of providers, maybe with the, with the best of intentions trying to collaborate with them and not really knowing how. So, I think that's the thing. A, a lot of times this lack of definition and a lack of a comprehensive philosophy around what a person-centered planning process really looks like, it can do a lot of harm. It can reinforce old harms. As Sarah said, yeah, again, you want to be trauma-informed, but you want to make sure that's not just another buzzword. So often in, in like grants, in just 
things that people are showing to their, their funders to, to demonstrate that they're really doing the work. It uses this language without a deeper understanding and without a way for the staff of these programs and services to, to gain a deeper knowledge and a deeper insight in, in, about what these things mean. It can't just be something that you're reciting or you have a superficial understanding of. It really needs to be internalized to the point that it's automatic. And I, I know that's a heavy ask. And I, like, really, what I'm asking is not just to do these things lip service. Um, that if you're gonna, if you're gonna really use these kind of terms, practice what you preach. Like, there, there's a lot of consultants out there. If you if you can't do it yourself, look look at people who have. Look at things that are successful. And and most of all, look at if the people in your programs and services are happy get their input. I think that's so much, so often a missing factor is like, do people believe in what you're doing? Uh, if you're just kind of stringing them along and looking at outcomes and being like, well, we got this amount of people housing, we got this amount of people work, that's fine. But if they're not, if they're not happy with their, with their services, they're not going to be invested and they're not going to get the most out of them. And that's really what being person centered is all about, letting them direct the process. And I think another one of the biggest barriers is, is risk that so many, so many times this process goes off track is because of a lack of risk tolerance that people are uncomfortable with the dignity of risk. There can, like Sarah pointed out, there can be a lot of things that people are uncomfortable with, but risk is the big one. You've got to give people the potential to even fail in their goals and hopefully be there to pick them up and support them and say, okay, what did you learn from this? Like this didn't work. What did you learn and what else can we try? And I think that's a lot of where these go wrong and people kind of put the uh, the kibosh on them is when it's like, oh, well, this is too risky. You know, that this has happened in the past. The, the past is the past. And it, it, it really has to be a process of moving forward collaboratively with the person and realizing, yeah, we've all, had the opportunity to sometimes fail in life and you can do everything right and still fail. And it's not really a failure as long as you learn something from it and you're able to keep moving and adjust with the person rather than, you know, put them back into a system that's more looking to maintain where they are rather than let them grow and, and move closer to their hopes and dreams and goals in life. And uh, yeah, that's all I've got to say about this today. I. I really hope that you all can can take some things away from this and look for more ways to involve the people directly in in how your how your services and programs look and really give them the opportunity to be the driver's seats in their own lives. This is Bevan. Thank you so much. Um, there was so much in that, Andy. Appreciate you. Um, now I'd like to uh, invite uh, my colleague, Ebony Flint, um, to join us. Um, Ebony is a policy analyst at the Human Services Research Institute, or HSRI, which also happens to be the home of NCAPS. Um, she is a certified peer specialist um, and also a part-time trainer and group facilitator with the Wildflower Alliance, as well as a founder of a tribe called Black. Uh, throughout all she does, Ebony infuses knowledge gained from her own experiences as a survivor of trauma and the psychiatric system, as someone with invisible physical disabilities, and as the mother of an autistic child. Hello, Ebony, welcome. Hello, thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. I'm Ebony Flint, she, her pronouns. I'm a black woman with medium length locks. Some people may call them dreadlocks. I prefer locks. I have black glasses and um, a black sweatshirt on that says beware of strong black womanitis. And my background is blurred because I'm moving. So there's like a window and some white walls, but I've spared you all um, my background. So um, thank you. I'm glad that you all are here. And um, my co-panelists uh, have shared so much great information that I totally 
agree with and um, may reiterate a little bit, but the perspective I'm coming from with um, person-centered planning and mental health systems is just making sure that you think of the whole person and include the whole person and all of the things that they have going on in their lives, around their lives, in the intersecting systems that they are dealing with. As a trauma survivor and a mom of an autistic child, there was a lot I had to navigate when doing and participating um, in my mental health and emotional wellness via all the different programs, hospitals, day programs and stays. And it was very hard to navigate um, while being a single mom and having to do all the things that I needed to do for my daughter. And a lot of things that I needed to reject um, because of that were seen as been said before, non-compliant or just that I didn't want to do it or was it was lumped into my many symptoms associated with my labels and diagnoses, which was not true. And this was not helpful, you know, um, wanting to get the help and not being able to. Right now we have things, uh, more telehealth, et cetera, but with my um, disability, some invisible or ways that I needed to show up for my child, I wasn't allowed or I had to really fight to get in-home services for my mental and emotional wellness when I needed that for so many different reasons. And that was an added stressor. So how is this helping me? These are things that um, are adding to my emotional and mental distress and they're not being considered. It's seen as just something else um, I'm avoiding or neglecting or it's worded in a way that again, isn't helpful. If I have an intersecting system that I'm dealing with, uh, let's say DCF, you know, when you say certain things, this doesn't help, me. It, it may not help me. Or um, the assumption that uh, someone has family, extended family. If I'm coming from a trauma background, some that may have included my family, what family do I have to give my child to so that I could receive services uh, to um, participate in a day program or even a certain length stay hospitalization, even if that's what I wanted to do? Um, definitely, if that's not what I wanted to do. And making the space to have these conversations, making sure that I'm asked what I need and what I want. Again, something that was already said. Not being presented with what you think my options are and being asked what I, what I think they are despite um, my diagnoses and my um, symptoms, if you will, or limitations. Um, I also think what would be helpful too in um, making this uh, person-centered planning more person, centered is just um, partnering with other systems. I'm not asking um, you to be the end all be all or the only person or resource that someone has, but actually having other resources to refer um, people to. Um, if I'm saying this is what I'm struggling with and this is something that is really hard for me to navigate, at least knowing where the direction to point me in, having a connection because my um, life and my struggles doesn't start and end with you or the help or needs that I have with you. And so um, I think keeping all of those things in mind would be helpful. Also the denying or not wanting to take certain uh, medications or psychiatric drugs is very important. When I was on so many different ones, it was hard to uh, be present and not just my, my groups and uh, work, but as a mom. And then here's another thing that affects me and that stresses me. And so it's a cycle. And not taking these things into consideration and making the space for these, for someone to convey these things to you directly and in their own words is so harmful. And um needs to be at the forefront of this if it's gonna really be person-centered planning. Um, and I think that's really all I have to add on that because um, everything everyone has shared, I really feel strongly about and agree with. So thank you. And I look forward to the question.
This is Bevan. Thank you, Ebony. Um, all right, rounding us out this afternoon or morning, depending on where you are, uh, is Thomas Brown. Thomas is an advocate who spends much of his time working with the Mental Health Legal Advisors Committee using lived experience to leverage critical issues in the state legislature related to mental health. Thomas worked in a community mental health agency for over 13 years and in a crisis stabilization unit for two years. It's the harm and human rights abuses he witnessed in these spaces that informs much of his advocacy work. Thomas trains law enforcement and Department of Correction staff on trauma through crisis intervention training. Welcome, Thomas. Great. Thank you, Bevan. Uh, so hey, hi, everybody. My pronouns are he and they, and I am a white man. I have a Czech shirt on. Uh, I have pretty short, uh, dark brown hair with a little bit of uh, gray sprinkled in, or starting to be a lot of gray sprinkled in. Uh, I have, there's a mirror across the wall in my background, a couple of jackets hanging, a couple uh, red and blue pieces of glass on a small shelf, uh, and a very light blue wall. Um, so I want to speak today about um, some of my experiences working in community uh, mental health agencies. Uh, again, I, I worked in an agency for 13 years. Uh, then I also worked in a crisis stabilization unit that was partially run by the agency in a, a major hospital in Boston. Uh, and, and for the past four years, I've been a consultant uh, for community mental health centers who want to do more enlightened work. And um, I started off uh, working in an agency. I was uh, a clinical, I was studying clinical psychology at the time at a top university here in Boston. Uh, and my goal was to be the best clinical psychologist in the world. You know, I was going to be super smart. Um, and so one thing I did is I started working at a community mental health agency because I really wanted to, to get my feet in the ground. Uh, so I did that uh, starting uh, working there in a summer in between semesters. And there was this one point uh, when the director of the community contract, one of our, our largest uh, contracts in Massachusetts called um, uh, community uh, community led support, something CBFS, can't remember what that stood for, a large contract. This is the director of it. And he came in one day at this group home that I was uh, working in and he said, okay, we're going to do uh, person centered meetings and we're going to start today. So without any preparation, uh, he started, he called all the staff in the group home. There were about uh, somewhere between 13 or 15 of us, uh, called us into the conference room. We sat at a table and then he started calling people in. And my first thought is like, oh my God, person-centered support. That's just what, you know, that's what all these professors have been talking to us about. have been taught how wonderful it is, you know, how it just transforms lives. So I was really excited. And my thought was this director was somebody who was just incredibly sharp and, uh, you know, uh, kind of on the vanguard of being able to help people in a really good way. So he started calling people in. And the thing that I noticed most is that these conversations with the person, the person sat at one end of the table with all these people surrounding him, uh, and he was basically being interrogated. It had nothing to do with caring about the person or asking the person what they wanted, what they needed. It was asking questions about their behavior. Were they using drugs? Uh, were they having thoughts of hurting people? Uh, and it just went on and on and on, and not one not at one point in that conversation did anyone ask him what he wanted, what he needed, and how his so-called treatment was affecting him. They continued to call in people, one person after another. Every single person shook. Their hands were shaking, their necks, their heads were shaking because they were terrorized. And not a single person sitting at that table realized that they were terrorizing this human being. And then I realized a whole other dimension, some things that I had started uh, paying attention to witnessing in this group home, is that they were being yelled at, they were being tortured, food was being withheld from them, they were being threatened uh, with having their medication withheld, they were being humiliated, they were being terrorized on a daily basis, on a nightly basis, and this would go on for hours. So not only were they feeling interrogated, by this so-called person-centered approach, they were also sitting in the room with their abusers, with the people who terrorized them, 
not being able to, to call it out, not being able to name what was being done to them. And so within months of working there, I started reporting these really extreme abuses that were happening. Um, and, and again, you know, the terror that people were living with in their very own home uh, had nothing to do with person-centered care. And yet this organization and that community contract was all about person-centered care. And I really hate to be a downer. And I've always been that person in the room who's been the downer when it comes to talking about person-centered care in these organizations. You cannot practice person-centered care if you are supporting discrimination and hatred by staff. Staff who say the clinicians, the people who think they're doing really good work knew what was happening in this organization. And by the way, this is a very large organization in the Boston area that has a really super reputation. Well, maybe not so super anymore now that I've been talking so publicly about them. Um, but they had this great reputa reputation. Clinicians knew what was happening. They saw what was happening and no one did anything about it. And in my view, that kind of passive allowance of terror is the same thing as committing the terror. It means that you think these people have so little value that the discrimination that you hold inside of yourself is so powerful that you allow them to be dehumanized, to be tortured on a daily basis. And pat yourself on the back because you think you're really doing good work, that you're doing your thing that you were taught in school, like I was taught in school, you know, do all these things like person-centered care. You think you're you're doing all the great things, you get make a decent salary, go home, you feel good about yourself. Um, these people living in those group homes never get to 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 go home to a safe place. It's never safe there. Uh, and and so I started reporting what I saw there. And my initial thought is that, my God, the people who run this agency are going to be so happy. I am bringing this to their awareness. They are going to be so grateful. Uh, and, and you know, to be true, the, the director or the, the person who was the vice president of that, of the mental health branch of that organization, which was huge, was really fond of me. She knew that I just did really great work and people really enjoyed being with me, the, you know, the residents of the group home. Um, and felt respected. And once I filed a report of what was happening there, thinking that like, okay, we're going to take care of this. You know, people are going to be really happy with me um, and we're going to make this organization great. The first thing that happened is that the next morning after I filed a report, the director of that group home was instructed to take me into that conference room where that person-centered care uh, was happening uh, so-called person center care, and to bring in resident after resident to ask them if I had yelled at them, if I had intimidated them, if I had humiliated them. What that she was doing, what she was instructed to do by that vice president of the organization who was so fond of me and by the CEO of the organization and the top two vice presidents was to find fault in me to make it out that I was the one who was uh, abusing these people. Um, I was stunned. It was literally one of the most devastating events of my life. I am a survivor of very extreme and chronic sexual assault as a child, physical assault, and emotional terrorization. And this event, almost 17 years on, was one of the most devastating events in my entire life. And I've spent my life since then uh, advocating against this kind of care, quote unquote, pick care. Um, and I want to go further with this. So investigators came in from the organization, not from with outside, outside of the organization. They came in and they were um, told to ask residents if they had been abused. Not a single one of the residents acknowledged that they were being terrorized on a daily basis because they were so terrified of retaliation by those staff. So they were being asked to narc on their abusers and then asked to stay with their abusers. Um, and no action was taken. The, uh, the, my accusations basically were found um, to have no basis in reality whatsoever. And there was a ringleader in that abuse that was happening, somebody who encouraged the other staff to do this. She was the person I really focused my report on. 
uh, and nothing happened to her. She was asked to leave work for a few days and she came back, no discipline whatsoever, but besides being paid to, to be home, you know, for a few days. Five years later, in that same group home, she was the um, the, the staff leader uh, overnight. A woman fell down the stairs and crawled in, in extraordinary pain, crawled sobbing into the office where this woman, this kind of ringleader of the staff uh, was sitting. And the staff person, this woman, uh, yelled at her to get back upstairs. This woman crawled away from the office and started calling, crawling up the stairs. The next morning at seven o'clock, she was found uh, nearly dead on the stairs. Her lungs had punctured, I mean, her broken ribs had punctured her lung and, and pneumonia had set deeply in. Um, she spent the next three or four months in the hospital uh, and she barely survived that event. Then the agency took discipline action against that person. It took an, a person nearly dying in a really horrific way uh, for them to take any action. So community agencies are more concerned about keeping their names out of the paper than protecting people, helping people be safe, feel safe, and helping them move toward what they want in their lives. The concern is not about helping people have the best life that they want. It's about the agency's reputation. And I, I was finally able to break through that. Ultimately, I went to the or commissioner of mental health um, and uh, the CEO and the two top vice pre presidents were finally removed. And yet at that same organization with those actions taken, these same abuses continued to happen because those the residents and staff there continued to reach out to me with stories pretty much on, on a weekly basis. So that habit of discrimination and oppressing, that habit of hating people with mental health differences or, or people who have challenges, people who have a lot of trauma and extreme experiences, that is so deep. It is so deeply embedded. And a leader at this organization, after I had encouraged our peer support team to really start reporting everything they saw, um, again, tried to shut me up and told me to tell, I was you know, uh, coordinating the team at that point, I was told to, to ask everybody to back off. Uh, and he told me because I confronted him, he, I, you know, I wanted to know, did you not know that this was happening? Honestly, he said, yes, we did. But we just thought that that's the way it is. And this was a person who was almost the commissioner of mental health at one point. It's at that top level that they believe that this kind of behavior by staff, this kind of discrimination and oppression is completely acceptable. And I speak to people all over the world, and this is happening all over the world. And it is just incredible how similar the stories are everywhere. And those of us who are brave enough to speak up and try to stop the violence that's happening are always scapegoated. My pay, I was uh, given at one point I had a promotion with a, a $20,000 raise uh, that was canceled for me because I had encouraged the peer support team to speak up about the abuses that were happening. That retaliation against staff just continues. And it, you know, it's it's just absolutely universal. So while I care greatly about person-centered approaches and especially person-driven approaches, um, I have to acknowledge that. You know, you can you can be the best organization in the world, the best clinician, you know, best peer supporter, even offering really great support to somebody. And yet they go back home and they're terrorized. It's just canceled. It's completely wiped out. So when I heard about this, the seminar, I was a little maybe a lot skeptical because this is always the truth that people are being terrorized They're You know, and there are all sorts of human rights that are happening. I, I'm talking about the raw basic um, really aggressive stuff, but there are so many human rights there, are, uh, abuses that are happening. Um, and so, so it has to be said, I used, I got to a point where I just shut up because it seemed like it didn't matter. And everybody hated me for speaking. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking again and I'm speaking a lot more loudly. Um, and, and so it has to be said that this work can be canceled out if we don't go to that basic discrimination oppression and hatred that's happening uh, toward people. I am hopeful. I know that this can be done and it can be done well and it can be done in a way that is human 
and helpful. Um, organizations, countries that practice open dialogue in Europe, there, I mean, there's proof that, that we can have an entirely different approach that, it, that is human and, and not harmful. Um, but we have to choose that approach and we can't choose that approach without acknowledging uh, the great harms that we're carrying out hourly. Um, so thanks a lot for having me. Um, I'm happy uh, to take any questions in the Q&A or people can uh, put them in chat. This is Bevan. Thank you so much, Thomas. I would like to invite um, all of the panelists to please pop your cameras on and join us uh, for Q&A. Um, we've gotten a, a couple of questions in chat. I, I suspect that we will have more questions than we will have time to answer, but all of the panelists here will have the option to um, to respond in writing to any questions that we don't get to. So if you have a question um, that you haven't put in the chat yet, please do. We will save the transcript and, and send those around uh, later on. Um, and um, for this webinar, we are asking that all the questions, everyone, please put questions into chat. Um, if you have your hand raised, unfortunately, we don't have the, um, the capability to, to um, take questions that way. Um, all right, so um, I'm hoping we can get to at least a couple rounds. Um, I would like to um, start by asking, we've, we've, I, I think a recurring um, metaphor today has been tables. Uh, we, we've heard uh, stories of, um, you know, uh, you know, a discussion of sort of whose table is it? Um, Thomas gave us a vivid and harrowing description of a table that was called person-centered that um, was just the opposite um, and, and really an instrument of trauma. Um, uh, so I wanted to open up by asking um, asking a, a, a question you know, that, that came out of a lot of the comments um, in keeping with the table metaphor. Can would anyone be, like to you know just describe a, a, a table um, that you've been at or maybe you have hosted um, that is um, about us with us you know that that is you know what you would consider person centered and if you'd like to go uh, you can you can come off mute and I'll see I'll see that you're like to share. Andy. Yeah, I, I, I can describe one. Um, it, there was once somebody I, I worked with quite and quite extensively who was in community services similar to the ones that were being discussed in the chat community mental health services. I realize they're different from state to state, so we don't have to get into the acronyms. Um, but they were living in subsidized housing in an, an apartment complex owned by a mental health agency where most of the people there were um, were people who were also in either the same or similar services. Um, what, what was what I think was really effective about it is our peer support team kind of facilitated putting this whole thing together, and so the person was having issues with both their mobility because they were someone who was in a wheelchair and also their general kind of anger and dislike of life and their situation, which would often lead to conflicts, let's just say, without getting too much into this person's um, personal things. What, what was effective about it was the person was able to talk to us and then figure out who they wanted to invite there, which included their neighbors, their, in other words, their natural supports within their community we held the meeting in their community. There was a meeting room in this apartment complex and we invited providers to it. And again, the providers looked at us like we had two or three heads because this wasn't how things were rarely done. But yet this, this provider would have had no problem saying that they were very person-centered. And yet when we do something that's actually person-centered, it was kind of the exception not the norm of, of inviting who the person really wanted there for a meeting, having the providers not there to run the meeting, but kind of to be a, 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 an equal participant in 
the meeting rather than the one trying to come up with the plan and them kind of having to listen to this person <laughs> kind of direct the whole process. In my opinion, that's what something person centered should ideally look like. They choose who's there. They choose a venue that they're comfortable with. They choose they they it's it's centered around their voice and their choice and they're directing the process. That's how somebody builds their own table. Would anyone else like to describe a table? Ebony. Yeah, so um my example is uh with um bearing witness to an open dialogue conversation. And um, not all of those have been successful for me, but this one example I want to give was seemed really cool. And it was kind of like with what Andy shared in that um, the person was able to choose the place they wanted to talk to, who they wanted there, um, especially as their own support. And I got to witness them um, you know, just voicing their needs when they wanted someone to um, share more than they could at that time for their own reasons. Um, and also it was fun to witness them be honest. Um, in other situations, it's been the doctors or, you know, the people in the homes, et cetera, saying their issues and the person is there and they're kind of just receiving it. And this person was like, I don't like you because, and <laughs> it was cool to like hear them feel comfortable and supported and being honest about even their negative experiences. And that was great. And that to me seemed um, person centered. Seven, thank you. Ebony. Um, next question. Um, there's a, a lot of emphasis these days on crisis services. It is a, 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 a topic of the day in a lot of mental health service systems. Um, and so I'd like to lift up a question from Dana in chat. How do we practice person-centered planning in crisis services? Um, there's a need to get information, right? Because it's a, you know, this is a time sensitive um, service. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, balance that with, um, you know, pro providing immediate services. So we'd like to hear your reflections on person-centered planning in a crisis service context. Yeah, Thomas. So I, I think one thing that needs to happen initially to be person-centered in crisis response, which, by the way, is a love of mine because I have been so many horrible crises and um, have have not just never received, you know, the support that I needed. But I think the the first thing that needs to happen that people need to drop their biases, yeah. you know, get out of that mindset of suicide. If somebody says suicide, that you know, oh, this great danger is happening. Um, if somebody says they want to hurt somebody and they're feeling real rage, don't demonize it. Stop pathologizing it. Basically, don't do anything the DSM would tell you to do or the clinical psychology programs teach you to do. But approach the person as a human being that's had a really awful time and think of yourself. You know, how have you been and when you've been feeling really awful and respond to the person with kindness and and care um and stop thinking so much about about yourself um so i i think just responding the person to the person if, you, if you're responding to a person in a crisis as if they have a brain disorder as if they have a chemical balance or if they're you know the the, the biggest criminal that ever existed you're not going to any response you, you make is not going to be helpful to that person you have to understand that they're deeply human and respond to them in that way and, and remember that we are all the same human capable of all of these feelings. Uh, and there's nothing unique about the person in front of you or yourself. Bevan, thank you, Thomas. Sarah. Yeah, you know, in a lot of our trainings, we use something called VCVC, which stands for validation, curiosity, vulnerability, and community. I don't have time in these last few minutes to get into all of that. But embedded in that is the ability to just even in crisis, explore with someone, trust that they are the expert on themselves, explore with them, ask creative questions no one else is asking of them. You know, I, I remember 
someone that I was supporting that was very suicidal and I kept getting stuck in trying to figure out what's the right thing to say to make them stop being suicidal. And ultimately the most effective question I asked them after stumbling a bunch was, is there anything you wanna do before you die? Cause I had to accept that he wanted to die and he ended up moving through that. He ended up moving because of that question. It made space, I dropped my agenda. It made space for him to talk about the mark he wanted to leave on the world. And through that conversation, it was about his art. He wanted to create this art show. Uh, he rediscovered the sen his sense of beauty in the world and his like connection to it and wanted to stick around. And I'm not saying like that's the magic question, but I am saying dropping our agenda, dropping the sense that we know the answer or where to push someone, um, that that can make space. And we can do that in crisis. And we've done a ton of training, even with crisis clinicians around VCVC and alternatives to suicide that talks about those pieces and how to let go of the idea that we need to have the answers. And uh, I'm, I'm really scrunching this because we have so little time left, but I hope that people will explore just the power of being with people and asking creative questions that nobody else is asking, even in the, some of the toughest moments. This is Bevan. Thank you, Sarah. And um, in the accompanying materials for this webinar, I think we can be sure to gather up some links um, and, and a list of resources that are referenced here. So, um, so folks who are interested in learning more can do a little more of their own research. Um, we just have moments left, so I would like to do one last lightning round. Um, would love to hear from everyone in in a, in a in a you know in a brief way, um, lifting up a, a question from Cheryl in the chat. Uh, what, in your opinion, are the next key action steps uh, we should be uh, working towards um, to uh, to advance for some centered planning? What's 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 your call to action? We can and we can part with that. I think in order to make progress with this with providers, we need to make a lot more space for providers to grieve that they've done harm, mm -hmm. to be open about some of their experiences. Uh, in our alternatives to suicide groups, we've only had which existed for over decades, and and the only people are of among five. I think a couple of the people who ended up dying by suicide in those. 10 plus years have been clinicians who have felt like they couldn't be real. We need to make that space and support people to understand what it's like to lose the power that people lose in the system in order to move forward in real ways. I would say that make your number one priority being a human rights-based organization. Thank you, Thomas. Andy, Lionel, Ebony, any, any parting calls to action? I've got one, but you all go first because I talk a lot. Go ahead. Go ahead, Evan. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say just um, again, making sure you're hearing the person and, and their needs, um, taking the your agenda um, out of it and not lumping them into the boxes of their diagnoses and uh, medications, limitations, et cetera. Let them um, share their inner wisdom and trust that. Thank you. Andy. I think the big one is acknowledging that it's going to be more work. Um, that's the thing that people don't want to hear. And it's sometimes why these things don't blossom like they should, because it's more work and everyone is so already so overworked. Um, you know, it's more work to prep someone for a person-centered meeting. It's it's more work when they go in and they don't really have any goals to flush them out. And so I think I think it's it's just reinforcing this idea of like, hey, we know it's we know this isn't easy. And any work that's really worth doing that's really going to improve things, it's going to be uncomfortable at times. And there's going to be some really heavy lifts at times. And and acknowledging that. And then figuring out a way to work together to get it done, uh, to move beyond that. Any, uh, so thank you so much. 
um, for everyone's contributions and words, um, your insights, they're valuable. You're getting lots of love in the chat. Um, uh, before folks leave, if you could, please um, take just a moment. There are six questions in the poll that just popped up. Um, let us know what you thought about today's presentation. Uh, we do use this information to inform and plan our future webinars. Um, we hope to see you uh, here again next month um, uh, on our next, our next webinar. Um, and feel free to get in touch in the meantime. Um, thank you to all. Have a great afternoon.